Junior, meaning son or daughter, aspires to take over the family ranch, and that's the start of peeling the layers back on this onion. Often it is or becomes a very contentious family issue, first from the point of other siblings, and then later, the relationship with mom and dad. Five years later, they're really frustrated that they're still just in the role of hired hand, right, at, at home, and, and it creates some real frustrations and animosity. But first and foremost, is what you're passing on a legitimate business or an expensive hobby? If that's the way that your ranch is structured, it is unlikely that the succession event is going to be successful. Dallas Mount, CEO and owner of Ranch Management Consultants, joins me to provide insight as to what can be done to reduce or avoid major family malfunction in bringing Junior back. When should it occur? How should it occur? What's Junior's role in this? And what's the parent's role in this? On today's episode, episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Welcome you here now to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We are glad to have you joining us on our program today. This is episode 100. And first of all, I appreciate you all, the listeners, for being a strong support to what we do here at the Working Ranch Radio Show and uh, appreciate the feedback we get from all of you. And like I've said before, if you hear something you like, let us know about it. Also, if you see it posted out on social media or you're listening to it through a podcast site, make sure you hit uh, click and like on that. It does several things. It helps me know uh, if there's certain types of topics that you all are enjoying so much, then I can continue to follow through on that. Today's show kind of falls down that line. And if you did listen to last year's uh, 2022's last episode, we were counting down the top three shows. And the very first show, the show that came in with the most downloads of 2022 and had the most interest was Why Own Cows? And of course, that topic or just the title in itself would create a lot of interest. But it was a very good discussion that I had with Dallas Mount, who's the CEO and owner of Ranch Management Consultants. Well, I thought, well, shoot, he does such a great job anytime we've had him on here of bringing up certain topics that are very, um, let's just say, maybe sensitive is the best word to say uh, for our ranching industry. And so today's title is Why Junior Shouldn't Come Back to the Ranch. Boy, I'm sure that caught your attention just a little bit, but really it is a big topic that um, is probably creates a lot of tension in our, in our, in our businesses, in our ranching uh, families. And so it is something that I I don't know that there's probably a family ranch out there that uh, hasn't been through it or will be coming to that point at some at some point in their in their ranching business about what do they do? How do they transition to that next generation? You've got a a son or a daughter that is wanting to come back to the ranch. And how do you make that work? And it it really is a very, very big topic. So today, that's what we're going to be looking at the timing of how that can come together. What are what should Junior be doing? Uh, What should the parents be doing to make this happen? And today we're going to give you the opportunity to hear some insight from Dallas Mount, CEO and owner of Ranch Management, as as he and I discuss this topic, uh, both him from his knowledge of working with a lot of ranchers out there uh, across uh, North America. From my own self, I have experience mainly from the concept of coming through a a family transition uh, with my folks' place and then also having a young son in college right now and what I'm preparing preparing him for and as he looks at having some interest of maybe aspiring to be on the ranch at some point someday down the road. So I think you're going to hear a very real discussion between myself and Dallas that I think will be very relevant to so many of us here in our ranching business. And I look forward to bringing you this topic here today. Of course, be sure to stay tuned throughout our entire show as meteorologist Don Day will be joining us uh, towards the bottom of the show with a look at our long-term weather as he does in every episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Right now, it is time to check in with the captain, Tim O'Byrne. He is the publisher and editor of Working Ranch Magazine for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody out there in Working Ranch Radio Land. Join me in congratulating Justin on his 100th episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show slash podcast. Last time I looked, Justin, we uh, we were over 180,000 cumulative downloads in uh, over the holidays, you kind of did uh, the best of series, three series 
uh, shows, which are really good. I'm, I'm glad we went back and uh, revisited a lot of that stuff. And folks, you can get it on the podcast. It's right there. Just Justin, tell them where they can find it anywhere. Uh, on our website is a great place to go get it and go back. Listen to all 100 episodes this afternoon. Wouldn't take you long. Now, uh, this is my concern today. This is a presser out of University of Missouri Extension. Um, and it is uh, fescue foot reported in Missouri cattle. So, folks, if you're out there grazing on uh, Kentucky 31, um, have a look at this. Uh, University of Missouri Extension specialists recently received several reports of Missouri cattle dying due to fescue foot, says MU Extension State Forage Specialist Craig Roberts. These significant losses show why beef producers should check herds for warning signs of fescue foot in early January when it most often occurs. Cows that graze on infected fescue are vulnerable to fescue foot following extreme cold spells, which we've had. He says, during cold weather, producers might notice that some cows or yearlings on fescue pastures move slowly or limp early in the day. They should act quickly on these early warning signs of fescue foot. All right. Early detection is vital, says Roberts. If signs are caught early, cows can be moved off toxic Kentucky 31 pastures and given other forage or feed. If you wait to move cattle off infected pastures, it may be too late. If left on toxic pastures, limping cows can lose hooves and become infected with gangrene. Check with your local veterinarian or your extension office. Back to you, Justin, and I hope 2023 is amazing. All right, thanks, Captain. And yeah, like he was saying, if you want to go back and listen to any previous shows of the Working Ranch Radio Show, you can go to Working Ranch Magazine's website. There's a link there. Or if you're already in a, uh, some sort of a podcast provider out there, there's dozens of them out there. You can search Working Ranch Radio Show and we're liable to pop up on one of those and you can go to listen to any show you'd like to at your own leisure. Now, speaking of Working Ranch Magazine, as we get underway with another year, a good way to get started with that and get some Something in your hands in every issue that has a lot of very relevant information to us as ranchers. Have you started your subscription to Working Ranch Magazine? If you want to find out more, go to their website at workingranchmag.com. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to get into our feature topic, why Junior shouldn't come back to the ranch. Yeah, there's more to it. And you're going to find out what that's all about when we come back on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Don't keep your cow-calf herd data in a notebook. Keep it in the cloud with Performance Ranch and say so long to decoding handwritten notes. Performance Ranch is an easy-to-use app that simplifies record-keeping and makes decision-making easier. Keep track of herd inventory, monitor health records, and manage costs all from your iPad or iPhone. Group texting important herd data? Delete it. Use Performance Ranch instead. Go to performancelivestockanalytics.com and be the first to know when Performance Ranch is ready to launch. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As we head into now our featured interview and topic here for the day, and I, I'm guessing it caught a few folks maybe off guard a little bit by the title of our show here today. And joining me for this is Dallas Mount, CEO and owner of Ranch Management Consultants. And we've had Dallas on before, but I thought in light of going back to the last year, as we, and I don't know if you caught the last few shows of the year, we were recapping down to the top 10 shows. And our number one show was Why Own Cows? And Dallas, you were of course my guest on that and that again another a title that kind of shocked a few folks on that but it was a very good discussion we have so I thought as we get show number 100 I thought it would be good to have you joining us for that so uh, appreciate you being here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. You bet, Justin. I'm excited to be back. Uh, always enjoy getting on with you. So as we look at this topic, there's there's definitely no question that uh, moving the ranch to the next generation or the end game for the ranch is, it really is a big topic that does entangle a lot of our ranches. It, it is for sure. And, you know, when I visit with people in the ranching business and I ask them, what do you want? Right. Just just that question. What do you want? What, what's the long-term goal? Why, why are you in this business? One of the most common things I hear is, I want the opportunity for my kids to do this if they want to, right? So I think bringing the, the kids into the business is a you know enormous driver behind a lot of the things that we do in ranching. So so if we step back from that a second, and if, if we were to step maybe away from our business and look at it from the outside looking in, 
I, I think an interesting question to ask is if we want our kids to someday lead this business, what do we need to do? What, what do they need to do to help them become equipped so that they're best qualified to lead this business in the future? And so, so looking at it that way, mm-hmm. right? So if, if we're looking at bringing on a senior level partner into our business, what kind of things would we look for in that person and in their skills? So, so that might bring us to the show topic a little bit about, you know, maybe why junior shouldn't come home. Okay? <laughs> and, and I think what, where I'm coming from, from that is if, uh, if the kids are at a stage now where maybe they've, uh, you know, they've gotten out of high school, maybe they went off and got a, a degree for a couple of years, a technical degree, maybe they went to a four year program. Maybe they just graduated high school and, and, you know, went to work for the neighbor down the road for a year or two. Uh, you know, when is the right time to say, hey, we'd, we'd love to have you back in this business? And, and I think if you're looking at it from that standpoint of how do we build the best, the people that are best equipped to lead this business into the future, then in, in my opinion, it's probably not right to bring the kids into the business just two or three or four years uh, after being gone, mm-hmm. especially if they haven't had some, some really significant experiences. And I don't think going to a four-year school, right? So it, like if you grew up on this place and you, know, you spent your, your evenings and weekends working on the family place, and then you went away to a four-year school, and maybe you came back over the Christmas, over the summers, and, and now you're done with that. I don't think that's the right time to say, yep, there's a spot for you here. Come on back. I, I just don't think those people have developed the, the skills and the perspective and, and had the opportunities to stretch their wings they need to at, at that point. So, yeah. so my suggestion to the ranches that we work with is to, is to delay that homecoming for, for a while. Yeah. So today when we're talking about this, Dallas, I I really see us maybe talking to two different audiences. I think we're going to be talking to uh, definitely the the owners, which is maybe mom and dad, granddad and grandma, you know, who knows, uh, and also juniors, uh, you know, the son or the daughter uh, that might be wanting to come back to the place. I really see us talking to those two different audiences here. And so if, if we start to narrow down first to junior, let's because I think there's a lot of conversation that we're going to have about what what mom and dad need to do that are looking at that. So let's first let's first look at junior and, and the fact that what do what should they be doing in this time frame? frame of of getting ready if if the idea of maybe coming back to the family ranch is an option down the road what should they be doing so i think they should be looking for opportunities to uh, go to work for places that are going to uh, let them have some experiences that they that they aren't going to get at home and and actually i think sometimes it's easier to have um, you, you know more more responsibility oftentimes away from home than it is to have at home um, so, so if you're, let, let's say you grew up on a ranch in, in Texas, right? Let's pick West Texas, for example. And you're, you're thinking you might want to go back there and, and run that operation. Then when I'm, when you're looking for opportunities, I would encourage you to look for something outside of your geographic area that you're familiar with, mm-hmm. right? So maybe you want to go, uh, Texas going to Oklahoma, right? That's a heresy, but let's say you want, maybe you want to go to Oklahoma <laughs> and work on a place that runs wheat cattle, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe you want to come to the mountain West and work on a place in, in Wyoming, Western Colorado, Montana, right? Somewhere like that to, to really just get a completely different experience. Maybe out in the, in the Great Basin Desert, right? Out in mm-hmm. Nevada, Utah, some of those places that, uh, that, that are running animals very different. So I think that would be one thing to look at is go somewhere that's a different geography, totally different experiences, because then you're going to develop skills that are, that are going to be much more additive to the operation. Than if you just went to work for some place that ranches an environment similar to you, mm-hmm. um, I think another place thing to do is don't let salary and some of those things be the driver. Uh, look for somebody that that really has a reputation for for progressive ranching, right? Uh, you know, you want to be don't just take the first place that that comes along and says, "Hey, here's a here's a ranch job for you." And I'd be really careful of the ranch manager titles, right? You yeah. get a lot of. Uh, places that say, hey, we're looking for a ranch manager. And you would think, well, what are the duties? Well, uh, painting fences and mowing lawns, <laughs> right? Well, that, that's not going to help you, right? So so go go look for a place where maybe you're going to be pretty low on the totem pole, uh, but you're going to be working for an operation that uh, that you can really learn some from and, and, and so have some opportunity to grow. So, you know, and if you're there for a few years, maybe now you're in charge of an enterprise. Maybe you've got some uh, – 
people working under you that you're in charge of managing. And that that would be really good skills to learn uh, of how to lead, manage people, um, you know, get the best out of them, um, you know, and everybody's going to make mistakes. So I often say, go look for somewhere where you can, you can get your nose yeah. bloodied a few times, right? You can make some really stupid mistakes and, and uh, be able to do that on, on somebody else's dime. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think there's another couple things in there too. Uh, don't be afraid to go work for a bad boss. Mm-hmm. And it's probably going to happen, right? At some point, you're going to work for somebody who you think, boy, when I'm when I'm leading my organization or leading people, I don't want to do that, right? And and I think that's a valuable lesson to learn. But then also try to go work for somebody that, that you really think is a, is a pretty amazing leader of people because that's going to give you, okay, when when that person did this, this is why they did it, right? And and some and some abilities to incorporate that into into your style as you move forward yeah. so so those are some thoughts what, what would you add to that Jeff? well I, the things that i i think about a little bit on that dallas is is that it doesn't what we're dealing with here a little bit from a from a psychological standpoint or just uh maybe character or personalities this has nothing to do at this point in the game with whether in just ranching to me i think this is a this is an issue when you are dealing with uh kids that are fresh out of college and you know at some point starting to build a resume for a career that they may have what you had listed out some of those things that's it doesn't matter whether you're in ranching or whether you're in finance or whether you're in banking or whether you're whatever business it's going to be i think those are some some basic things and one of the things that i i feel sometimes as as the younger generation i and and i'm speaking mainly for myself is we get impatient yet you know when you're fresh out of college you got all these ideas and you think you know that you know everything and um, I think there's some impatience that if you've been in a job for maybe three or four years um, and take for example in our ranching industry you've been away from the ranch so okay you went through college or four years of college and you went to another place for four years you're thinking man if I don't get back that opportunity of going back to the ranch is going to go by the wayside and I believe impatience can be a very costly thing of not maybe getting the the depth of experience that would make you a better ranch owner manager down the road yeah that that's exactly right I think you know oftentimes you, you get these young folks right out of college or what you know whatever that stage of life they're in their mid twenties and, and they feel like they're ready, right? Okay. Hey, give me the reins. I'm ready to run this thing. And, and sometimes it, the, at home feels like, boy, if I just went home, uh, they're going to, they're going to hand it over, right? They're going to let me really, really take control of this thing. And, and perception and reality are oftentimes two very different things. And I oftentimes talk to the people that, that go home at that point and then they're, three, four, five years later, they're really frustrated that they're still just in the role of hired hand, right, at, at home. And and it creates some real frustrations and animosity that sometimes cause relationships to dissolve. So yeah, um, I think you're, right, you're absolutely right. Give it some patience, give it some time, and the likelihood of things being successful goes up with that time. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes is there's an element of don't try to create an opportunity that's not there. And maybe that goes back to the impatience thing is waiting for that to happen. I think to my own life, you know, I mean, I spent 15 years, uh, you know, out of college, past college before we ever moved back to the ranch. And I never, you know, if you'd asked me at year one of that 15 year time frame, were, were you going back to the ranch? I said, no. I mean, I had older siblings. I didn't, wasn't really set up that I was going to happen, but I can look at the two big, two jobs that I had during that 15 year time frame, And I can point to those are key into my ability to be a good uh, manager today is because of those two jobs that I spent 15 years on. So, you know, you talked about the fact that go, you know, work for a bad boss, do that. That's as important as working for a good one sometimes, just so you know what it's like. So I thought you had some great information there on that. Well, thank you. So, so there's one piece I think I'd like, since we're talking about it from the perspective of the younger generation, um, looking at coming back. Um, and, and, and encouraging people to give it some time. So one other piece of this is, you know, oftentimes the, the relationship is, is dad and junior, right? Whoever mm-hmm. junior is, because oftentimes it's dad. It's not always, but, but let, let's go with that analogy for now. Um, so what stage of life is dad in, right? So when, when junior's maybe, you know, 25, uh, dad might be 50, 
right? Mm -hmm. And and so what what is going on in the business right now and in and in dad's mind? Let's let's think about that. So so most of the time, what I see is when ranchers reach that age of life, they've just now kind of got it together. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it takes they do. some time to do that. So, uh -huh. so okay. So now you're. So let's put ourselves in dad's role. So, so you're 50 years old. You maybe you've gotten yourself out of a jam or two. Maybe you've cleaned up some debt. Maybe, maybe right now is when you're starting to feel like you've got got enough money to actually kind of do some things, right? And 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 now you've also got the relationships built. Uh, you know, you, you, you're doing business mostly on those relationships, right? Maybe you're grazing cattle for somebody and that's a long-term relationship. Maybe the, the way you're selling your animals or marketing your bulls or all those things are done through those relationships. So, so in some ways, dad's really finally just about now got it, got it together, yeah. got things figured out to where they're starting to work pretty well. He's not at the point where he's ready for junior to come back and make some wholesale changes. Right. Because mm -hmm. changes at this point are scary because now you're at the stage where you don't have time to build it again. Right. So if, if Junior comes back and he's like, hey, I, I want to do this, let's let's sell these cows and let's do this or let's completely change this part of the operation. Right. It's understandable that dad is probably going to be pretty darn resistant to those things. Yeah, okay? because because he's really just got the thing working well uh, and and, you know, I don't want to have to build it again if something goes wrong. So giving some time to those things, right? Allowing age to happen like it does to all of us and and letting those aches and pains get a little bit more and the troubles of running the business, right, add up. And if you wait till dad's maybe closer to 60 or even a little bit further on, now the likelihood of uh, of him being able to say, "All right, let me give you some sign a significant role in this thing," um, is, is going to go up, and he's going to be at a spot where maybe he's built some reserves, right? Maybe the just the need and desire of having somebody else to come into the business is, is higher. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so we we see that play out a lot with the businesses we work with. You bet. My guest today, Dallas Mountain, he's the CEO and owner of Ranch Management Consultants. And our topic at the top of the program, as you saw, is why Junior shouldn't come back to the ranch. And it was mainly to kind of catch your attention a little bit. But we're talking about that. And in this past segment, of course, we were talking more from the perspective of what Junior needs to be doing to prepare for that. Dallas touched on the fact that a lot of times there's a lot of frustration that builds when things don't happen in the right order. And so in when we come back in the next two segments, we're going to be talking about that as how we can put things. Uh, in the right order so that when that transition can happen it can happen in in a fashion that doesn't create so much frustration that ends up splitting the whole concept apart and we're, we're going to get more into that when we come back on the working ranch radio show Starting off in the right direction is essential to gaining an advantage later when you go to market your calves. And I have proof that the right direction is with Sim Angus Sired Calves. A 2020 study by K-State showed that Sim Angus Sired Steer Calves earn more at sale time than all other breed identified sire groups with at least 50 lots represented on Superior Livestock's 2020 summer sales. The proof's right there. For low risk, high potential calves with earning potential, be confident that Sim Genetics will give you more per head, period. Stand strong, Simmental. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. My guest today here is Dallas Mount, CEO and owner of Ranch Management Consultants. And uh, we're talking about uh, uh, why Junior shouldn't come back to the ranch. That was mainly a catchy title to maybe get you to click in and listen to our show here today. But really, it comes down to how do we make this work in a way if Junior is going to come back to the ranch, how this is going to work and how this needs to play. And in the last segment, we were talking about what the, the generation that could be coming back to fill these shoes up should be doing in the in the meantime and so now we're going to turn to mom and dad or granddad and grandma that's going to be passing this down or the aunt and uncle that's going to be passing this down to the next generation and what that looks like and and uh, off air Dallas and I were talking a little bit and and I, I had told I kind of mentioned to Dallas I said I really feel that the, a, a lion's share of the responsibility of this happening successfully does lie on on the generation that's going to be passing this down and we were we were kind of in agreement on that dallas is that right yes i think so you know it's it is incumbent upon ownership 
which oftentimes is, you know, either grandpa, grandpa, mom and dad, it's, it's encumbered upon ownership to make it clear what the expectations are and, and make clear what the role is going to be for the incoming generation. It is their job. And that, that incoming generation has the responsibility to ask for clarity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately, that clarity needs to come from from mom and dad, grandpa, grandpa, whoever the owners are. Yeah. You know, and I think we're, we're kind of dabbling into a couple different subjects in a way, in a way that's all tied together in terms of pushing this down to the, getting this available, ready to go to the next generation. But it's a, it's a tough subject for mom and dad, because if you're, if you're in a family that has more than one sibling, <laughs> more than likely, it's not just as simple as passing it down to junior. And I think that really has ways on mom and dad's or granddad and grandma's mind quite a bit. Do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that deals with a, a whole host of a lot of the conversations we have in our executive link program. And, and uh, these aren't easy conversations. Um, I've, I've got a few thoughts to that to share with you. Um, wh- one of those thoughts is that the easiest thing to do is to if, if let's say there's three siblings is to go a third, a third and a third, right? That that's the easiest thing to do. Um, that almost always results in the ranch being divided. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, you, we can all sit and say, well, my kids are going to ranch together. And when I'm gone, they're going to be holding hands and singing Kumbaya. Rarely does that work. Right. So sometimes they put up with it till mom and dad are either gone or out of the picture enough that they have the control to do with it. But it almost always results in, in the ranch being divided at some point. And I'm not saying that's a terrible thing. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, the matter of fact is at some point the ranch will probably be be divided. Yeah. Right. But do you want to have that happen on on the transition year that you're doing? So if you want an alternative, then the alternative is uh, to, to make it clear before the transition event occurs that this is our intent. We, we are going to give the, the, the land entity, whatever it is, we're going to give that intact to the person who returns. And in order to make that work, we're probably going to have some other assets somewhere else. They're probably not going to be of equal value, uh, but but they might be an insurance policy. They might be a you know set of mutual funds somewhere. They might be another business uh, that you've built over the years that you can you know give to the the non returning heirs. Uh, but to make this happen, it has to be planned for all along. And so what that means is taking profits from the business. Now that assumes that there's profits. So first of all, you got to set the business up to be, to be profitable, but then when there are profits to not stick them all back into the business. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's so tempting to do because when there are profits, we've got a laundry list of all these capital projects that we want to do. Uh, but you need to be disciplined enough to take a portion of those profits and to say, okay, we're going to put them over here or do this with them. So that there is something else to give to the non-returning ranch heirs. Yeah. You touched on something and we'll we'll have to come back to some of this other stuff, but I really quick while you touched on that or you hit that and said that comment, I want to go back to it. And that is a business. The business needs to be profitable, the ranch to be profitable. And, and I don't know. I don't know that we necessarily got the cart in front of the horse on our subject here today. But I think one of the things is that we've also got a lot of ranches out there that are maybe not in a situation that they're entirely profitable. And and yet we're trying to bring junior back. Those are two things that just are almost as setting the place up for failure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you put it a little mildly. I, I'll put it a little <laughs> okay. harder, harsher than you do. Most ranches are not profitable. I mean, that, that's the way it is. Most ranches are really expensive hobbies for the owners, right? And if, if that's the way that your ranch is structured, it is unlikely that the succession event is going to be successful, right? Because you're, you, the kids that are looking to come back in this, you're probably wanting them to continue running your hobby the way you've run your hobby, mm-hmm. right? Well, it's not reasonable to expect your kids to manage your hobby for low pay and a lot of work. Right. Yeah. So if you if they wanted to if you wanted to build something that's attractive to the next generation, let's make it profitable and make, make it something that has a healthy work life balance. So I, I think that is so important to, to make these things successful. And it's it's something that's way too often overlooked. Right. We just assume yeah. the kids are going to want to come back and be a part of this because it's something we've enjoyed. Well, they're probably not going to enjoy continuing it on if it's if it's huge amounts of work for low pay. Yeah. And that's why I guess I wanted to go back to that because I feel, I felt maybe we were missing a step there in, in, in the, in the fundamentally 
element of this and knowing that if if you know if this was any other business in the country let's not put ranching let's just say it's any other business it's a profitable business that you're going to pass down i mean otherwise you're just passing as you said you're just passing your hobby that's going to have to be subsidized by somebody working in town or or an off-site job of some sort which you know if that works for you i guess to a point but that's not probably the the healthy environment that we want it to be in um as, as you were talking about the splitting this up and and that essentially leading to some issues with that i think that's one element of our ranches that is is very difficult for mom and dad is is the equality of of getting that split up and knowing that if every time that ranch splits up it's less likely that it's going to get passed and, and stay together and be a functional and have the opportunity to be profitable yeah yeah that, i mean that's that's just a matter of fact is that as we divide these things that it becomes harder to, to put together a sizable a unit enough to support a family mm-hmm. um, so you know it, it really takes mom and dad sitting back and saying okay 10 years from now 20 years from now 30 years from now what do we what do we want and then how can we structure it during our time here to help make that be successful, mm-hmm. right? And and I, I want to encourage them to do as little of controlling from the grave as, as, as they can yeah. manage, right? Because you see the, a lot of these things structured in ways of these really complicated trusts and things that have very, you know, specific deals of you can do this and you can't do that. You know, when, when you're gone, you're the people that follow you need to have the authority of decision making to do what they think's best at that time. So, you know, I think just a lot of trust and faith um, in these things is, is the best way to do it. As we were talking the uh, in the breaks there, you know, the two frustrations for for kids uh, is the fact that there's just not clarity. There's not a plan and there's not clarity in that. And we talked about that just a little bit ago. But as we expand on that for parents, that planning process Where's the starting point? I mean, we're, we're, let's let's kind of give some put, put a little meat on that bone in terms of providing some guidance along those lines. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds good. So, so let's say um, I'm, we're sitting down with mom and dad, and and maybe juniors or away at college, or you know, they're maybe they're in their mid twenties, something like that, and the folks are starting to think, all right, should should we bring them back? What should that look like? So, what I would encourage them to do is is step out of their role as mom and dad and put on their hats as a business owner and say, okay, is this business, um, is it the right time to add another full-time employee to this business, right? And if we were to add a full-time employee, what does that look like? What, what would be the role in this business that that person would fill? Um, what we often do is we break the business down into some of the key elements that it's doing. Uh, for the production side of the business, right? That's the thing most of us are pretty good at, you know, raising calves, getting calves on the ground, you know, those, those pieces. Uh, other parts would be the marketing, uh, sales and marketing for- portions, um, finance, C- CFO roles, right? Mm-hmm. Managing cash flows, doing economic projections, um, the human resource department, right? Um, yeah. You know, how do we, what kind of structure do we need so people can be successful in this business? Um, you know, and then the role of the CEO, the person that's the visionary, that's looking out, that's, uh, you know, creating clarity on mission and vision and all those things. So so as you look at your business and those pillars, where are holes in your business? And then from that, I would create a position description of if we're going to hire somebody to come into this business, let's write a position description, right? What are the responsibilities that this person's going to do? What kind of results do we need them to produce? And then let's put together a compensation package that goes along with that, right? This is the cash salary. These are the benefits. Uh, these are the, uh, maybe maybe it's equity shares, right? Um, what is the housing uh, policy, right? And th- those kind of things really need to be thought out well, because that's where a lot of uh, confrontation occurs, especially when we're bringing in laws into the situation, right? So so if, if it's the house, right, who gets to decide what color the living room is? Who, <laughs> who decides when the dishwasher needs to be upgraded, right? All those kind of things need to be thought out in advance. So then when we've got this position description out there with a salary package, then maybe that's the right time to go to junior and say, okay, we we think our business is is ready to hire somebody. Here's what this position entails. This is what it pays. Mm -hmm. And if you're successful in this five years from now, this this is the role we'd like to see you filling. And then I would put very... uh, clear timelines and targets, right? When you've met these targets, then we move to this. 
so that somebody can grow into the responsibility of that business. So, so that's the best way to make it happen. Too often it's, you know, Hey junior, I'd really like for you to come back and be a part of this. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Right. And then they come back into the business thinking that their role is going to be, you know, a leadership role in the business and, and 10 years, 20 years, sometimes 30 (laughs) years from now, uh, they're still just a hired man, right. Or hired person. And there's a lot of frustration there. So, um, I think being being clear, putting on that business owner hat, doing some of that planning is is paramount. For sure. Dallas Mount, CEO and owner of Ranch Management Consultants is my guest as we're talking about uh, this whole element that's a big part of our ranching industry of getting it uh, passed down potentially to the next generation. Uh, it's a lot of, lot of different fingers that come into that that we're talking and hitting on here today. When we come back, we're going to continue that as we're focusing a little bit on what mom and for mom and dad and just some of the mindsets and the things that they need to be working on and plan through as well. We're going to continue with this conversation when we come back on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Set up the next generation for a productive lifetime with Zinpro Avela 4. Achieve productive success in your cows with 20% increased conception rate and a 16-day tighter calving interval. Calves from cows supplemented with Zinpro hit the ground running with improved immunity and 28 more pounds at weaning. Allow your cows and calves to perform to their full potential with Zinpro Avela 4. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As my guest today is Dallas Mount, CEO and owner of Ranch Management Consultants. We've been talking today about, as as you see in the title, kind of a catchy title, mainly to get you to kind of pay attention why Junior shouldn't come back to the ranch, but really talking about if if you're wanting Junior to come back to the ranch, how how can that happen and, and be done in a way that works? And in Dallas, at the break, I, I told you, I said, I'm probably going to come back here in this segment and maybe be a little tough on mom and dad a bit or the generation that's going to be passing it down and and this is really coming from experience and it's not uh out of disrespect for my folks or or even uh, my wife's folks that are still alive but my folks of course have passed away and we're and we just completed as of the end of last year the final conclusion after many many years of getting it uh, passed over to uh to my family and there's eight kids in my family so it was quite a quite a deal but all of that to say is that if if there's anything i can advise folks uh, whether it's kids or whether it's the generation is be very very clear with what you're wanting to do before you pass away and also at the same time with that is have realistic expectations of what how that can happen and in our mind we want everybody to get along we want every we want this to pass to the next family but yet we really don't set things up in such a way that it's going to happen because if if you don't set those expectations extremely clear before you pass away your kids are fairly amenable with each other once you're alive but once once mom and dad is out of the picture whether you want to believe this or not it's everybody for themselves and and that's even good christian families or good non-christian families that's the way it's going to happen and i think mom and dad need to know that if you're not clear and if you do not set a, a plan in place you basically set your family up for failure yeah i couldn't agree more justin i think you you nailed it and you know, the easy thing to do is to ignore it, right? To put your head in the sand and say, well, well they'll sort this out when I'm gone. Um, unfortunately, too often, I, I mean, it, isn't it interesting that, that those of us that are fortunate enough to be blessed with these wonderful agricultural assets, isn't it a shame that we allow those assets to tear our families apart too often? And it, it's just a shame. And, it, and the way to resolve that is for mom and dad are the current owners to have the courage and the love to say, you know what, kids, your mom and I love you very much. And this is what we've decided to do. Mm -hmm. And now we've brought on professionals to help us put this in place to where it'll work Mm -hmm. and to do it with a lot of clarity and, and just the idea that this is what we've decided. We love you all, but this is what we want to do. Yeah. Right. And, and, that that's the way it tends to work is is when you can when you can have the courage and the ability to do that, um, you know, and our our frug, frugalness as farmers and ranchers oftentimes prevents us from doing that. Right. Well, I'm not going to spend that kind of money. Really, you're not going to spend. I mean, what if it was fifty thousand dollars to make this happen? Right. And you're probably sitting on a twenty million dollar asset. Right. It's completely foolish to not spend some money 
to help make that transition be successful. So what, whatever that takes. Yeah. And I think you had a really good point there and just saying, you know, folks, if you're, if you're going to love your family, then, then you, it's going to take a lot of courage and boldness to make some really hard decisions. But I think in the long run, it's the best. Uh, just a couple things, Dallas, we were talking about at the break there and, and you want to t- touch on, we have just a little bit of time here, but that was uh, a couple things here in terms of some timeline, scalability, and some, some of those concepts. Hit those uh, real quick. Sure. There, there's a lot of things to get in this conversation today, and we're not going to be able to hit it all, but a couple more things to consider. Number one, if you're going to add another family to the business, the business needs to be of a reasonable scale to support that. Um, our target is uh, for every $400,000 in gross product of business produces, it can support one FTE, right? So if you're looking at your ranch and, and you guys are doing a million dollars in, in gross a year, a uh, gross product, uh, now you have to look at our material to see what, how we identify that, but gross product, then that means that business could support two full-time employees, right? It meets that target of 400000 Too often we see businesses that are barely scraping to support one family, and now they're trying to add a second to it. So, so let's just be real about the scalability of that. Now, that doesn't mean when Junior comes back, maybe we can say, hey, we want to invite you back, but we're not at the scale to do that. But we hope that in five years, you'll help be able to grow our business to that. Right? That, that, that's fair. But I just think we need, to be, we need to be real with those things when we sit down and consider it. Mm-hmm. The, the second thing I want to bring on uh, to folks, and, and this came from a group of EL alumni that shared an article with me uh, that was out of one of the, I think it was the New Yorker magazine. And it said, your management decline is coming sooner than you think. (laughs) And it it was about uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and the decade of life of the leader in those businesses. And it was really hard on those people that are past their 50s in terms of the decade of life. Mm -hmm. Well, you think about ranches, right? Many ranches aren't transitioning leadership of that ranch until somebody's in their 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s. Yep. Right. Well, so I I just want to encourage people to think or to let them know the transition of leadership in your business should happen sooner than you think. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, I'm in my 60s and I've just got this thing figured out. It's probably time to seriously start the transition leadership in that business. And, And if you wait another five years, it's probably too late. Right. I mean, so so how do you do that? It doesn't mean it has to happen all at once. Right. It's not a walk in one day and and you're the boss and walk in the next day and junior's the boss. Right. It's you know, how can we give them pieces of this so that within five years they're they're equipped to lead the whole thing. Right. Um, But I would just encourage people that 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 transition of leadership in your business needs to happen sooner than you think. But by the time somebody's in their 40s, they really should be controlling the decision making in it. So that that's yeah. just my thoughts. Yep. Um, Dallas, I want to thank you for joining us. Before we go real quick, I know uh, you're headed out next week. You're and it's busy. <laughs> this is the busy time of the year for you. You got a lot of schools coming up. Is that right? That's right. We're going to do five schools here in the next four weeks. Um, most of those are full. Uh, we do have some availability in our school in uh, Rapid City right now. That's in. Um, late January. And then we've got a school in Grand Forks, North Dakota, late January, early February. That's got some availability in it. Um, But uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing a lot of people and putting a lot of folks through the Ranching for Profit School. It's uh, it's a fabulous time of year where we get to make a lot of connections. So uh, excited for for the work ahead. Well, I appreciate you coming on and I appreciate the 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 knowledge you have because I know you talk and you deal with so many ranches that the perspective that you're coming at at this isn't just out of your hip pocket it's the fact that you've had multiple conversation with ranches that have dealt with this very topic so I appreciate that perspective that you bring to us uh, your website ranch management consultants dot com if they want any more information on your schools or, or your uh, anything you have going on right that's it yeah thanks thanks for letting us come on and you know I guess I just I'd like to give a lot of credit to the ranches that have allowed us to work with them on these, uh, you know, fairly sensitive subjects. So it does take a, quite a bit of trust to open up and, and to have these conversations. And and that's where what's allowed uh, our business to understand this subject a bit deeper is through the trust that those others have placed in us. All right. Well, Dallas, I appreciate you joining us for the 100th show here of Working Ranch Radio Show and uh, best of luck in 2023. 
Thank you. And again, our guest today has been Dallas Mount, CEO and owner of Ranch Management Consultants. As I said before, his website can be found at ranchmanagement.com. And we touched a little bit briefly on the ranching for profit schools that are going on. If you want to find out more information about those, you can go to that same website as well. Before we go to break, though, just a couple comments on a, on a couple things that we discussed here today. And that was in regards to one thing was on the experience that Junior goes and gets before coming back to the ranch. And I think there's another good reason for doing that. Say sh- something were to happen on the ranch, either before they come back or while they're there. I believe that the experience that they can get before coming back, should something happen, and we don't want not wanting that, but should that other experience that they've gained before coming back to the ranch could open up some doors for them should they need to down the road. And I think that's a valuable point to be thinking about for that. Now for the parents or the generation that's looking at passing this ranch down or looking at Junior and how that's going to work. As we talked about today, we were hitting, we, Dallas touched on a few things as far as times, uh, ages, and, and time frames and when this needs to be happening. And I want you to know, too, that while we have set some of those and given some guidelines on those, it is never too late. Do not think that, it, say you're in your 70s or in your 80s and you've missed the boat and you feel you've missed the boat. That is not the case. If you're alive and you're breathing and you're kicking, it, you can come up with a plan. You can start this process and you can do do some things that will be very helpful in keep making this a positive experience and a successful transition to that next generation. So it's never too late to start and it's never too early to start as well. Well, stay with us. When we come back, meteorologist Don Day joins us as we take a look at our long-term weather. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. Cattle producers, here's a way to put more dollars in your pocket. Put the Amifirm advantage found in all Gain Smart Mineral to work in your cow herd. Amifirm is the industry leader in increasing fiber digestion. In fact, research shows putting Amifirm to work increases forage utilization by 10%, reducing overall forage costs and allowing you to graze more animals per acre. That's a big time return on your investment. To find which Gain Smart Mineral formula is right for your heard, visit Gainsmart.com. And welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Justin Mills with you as we're joined uh, by meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. And Don, as you and I were talking before we went on air here, kind of uh, not to focus on particularly one part of the country, but we do see a pretty mediocre weather, uh, n- not too hot, not too cold uh, across most portions of the country. So we're going to look at the West because we are seeing pretty significant snowfall from those specific storms that really is going to be very very, very beneficial to the snowpack. Yeah, I mean, if you if you take a look at uh, where we've been over the last winters, last two or three winters and springs, especially in the interior west, I mean, poor snowpack years, not very wet springs. Uh, anybody that has looked at a drought monitor map would just see nothing but brown and red um, from California through a lot of the Plain States and the Rockies. And this pattern that's developed since early December uh, has really brought a lot of snow to the mountains of the West. Uh, we're looking at um, every snowpack drainage in Utah above 150% of average, some areas approaching 200% of average, same for uh, the Sierra Nevada of California. And uh, other than a few drainages in Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona, uh, we have above average snowpacks everywhere else. And we've got more coming. And not only is it snow, but a lot of rain falling in the Central Valley of California, uh, the northern parts of California, uh, parts of the interior that uh, have got very low reservoirs because of the last three years. Uh, there are some uh, snow drainages, snowpack areas, Justin, that are already 85% of their average, meaning 85% of the snow has already fallen mm-hmm. compared to their 30-year average with the rest of January, February, and March and April to go. So even if we would go to a average pattern for the rest of the winter, uh, it's going to be one of the better snowpack years in a long time. Mm-hmm. And you said a lot of this uh, in, a, in a weather cast I was listening to earlier uh, last or last week, I should say, uh, that some of this is reflective to seeing a La Nina weakening a bit. 
Yeah. In fact, uh, I went back and I looked and, and La Nina, which we be talking a lot about and hoping and, and waiting for it to fade finally and go away after being around for almost three years. Um, over the last five or six weeks here, it really has started to weaken. Um, it's still there, but it's weakening. And we've also seen an area of warmer sea surface temperatures up and across the north and the Pacific. And I went back and I looked and in in three other periods of time where something similar to what is happening now. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw that in, in the year, uh, we talked a little bit about the winter of 2010 and 11, mm-hmm. when that was a weak El Nino, a rather leak, a weak La Nina. Uh, 2016, 2017 was a fading La Nina, and so was 1996 and 1997. So these are, a, we, we, we saw similar heavy rain and snow events in the far west during those three winter seasons that are similar to what we're observing now. Um, and so, We've seen this before, um, and it's well-timed because December, January, and February for a lot of the far western United States is the rainy season. Um, and if you don't get rain during that rainy season, you know, that's where you're really hurting. Mm-hmm. So this is well-timed, and uh, we're, we're very encouraged at what we're seeing, that there will be a different storyline emerging this spring in many areas of the West because of what we've seen here over the last four to five weeks. Mm-hmm. So a final question here. We, I talked about at the very beginning that it's going to be pretty mild weather here for the next week or so across many portions of East of the continental divide. So when do you see the next major weather change across that's going to be effective to uh, most of the country? Well, at least for probably another 10 or 14 days, the stormy pattern in the far west will continue. And when you get stormy like this in the west, the Pacific air just kind of floods the nation. You cut off the Arctic air. The Arctic air doesn't have the ability to come south the way this jet stream pattern is evolving. So this means that most of the lower 48 states for another 10, probably 14 days, won't have what I would call any severe winter weather. There'll be some snow events, there'll be some colder weather, but the Arctic, like what we saw come visit in December, Mm -hmm. we're not gonna see that until the end of the month. I think after January 20th, and as we get to the end of January, starting to go into February, um, the Arctic will probably rear its ugly head again. And what'll happen is the stormy weather in the far west will take a break, and then we'll be focusing on the center and uh, eastern areas of the United States again, with the possibility of those that, are, that Arctic air cutting loose. It's building. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you don't have Arctic air having the ability to go further south, it's just going to build in those northern latitudes. And over the last two years, our bigger Arctic outbreaks have happened in late January and February. So um, if you're enjoying some milder weather, I, I very much encourage you to continue to enjoy it. But don't expect it that's, that it's going to last forever. All right. Well, uh, appreciate the uh, insight here today. Always, always good and always useful information. Thanks for having me. And again, that was meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. His website can be found at dayweather.com. And also there is where you will find the link to his YouTube channel, where he kicks out a daily video podcast every Monday through Friday. We'll be back in just a moment with a wrap on this week's episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. Before we head out here today, I want to leave another reminder that if uh, you're going back and you're listening to old shows or you listen to today's show on a podcast site out there and you like what you heard, let us know. Give us a thumbs up or leave us comments. That's very helpful. Or you can also send me an email. If, if you got an idea for a show topic, questions, or something else, you, my email address, justin.workingranch at gmail.com. Well, the Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's Ranch. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same place, or on your podcast provider. I'm your host, Justin Mills, and until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long. So long.